so yeah uh welcome everybody uh it's great that so many people have decided to join us this evening for this um sort of i guess well basically impromptu uh, event um i was fed up of not being able to go to readings uh in person or indeed online really uh so decided to organize this and a couple of people were good enough to kind of say yes to my request and i'm very grateful for them uh saying yes to that because otherwise it would have just been the saddest tweet that ever went out um, <laughs> so i'm glad that wasn't the case um so we've got six people reading in total this evening including myself um and first up we're going to have kit fry it um, everybody's going to read for about 10 15 minutes uh, and for those of you who aren't uh reading or speaking uh if if you want to send us messages uh, through the chat function that would be great uh, let us know where you're watching from and we can maybe take a minute to go through some of that at some stage later in the evening just to kind of get a sense of where everybody is um is uh is coming from for the night so uh yeah so just to introduce kit very briefly kit was born uh, in tehran in 1978 and his most recent book was Body Servant, published by Shearsman in 2018. Um, and I've known Kit, I don't know how long at this stage, but it's it's a it's a long time. Um, <laughs> and I'm very excited to hear him reading uh, yeah. this evening after a very long uh, time since I last heard him read. So uh, super excited for this. So Kit, I'll just pass it straight over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, David, for, for organizing this. I'm very, very pleased and flattered to be reading with such a fantastic group of people and thanks also to you all for being you know there wherever we, you are um, this first poem is called ashling copy as i was walking down by the lock hospitable to a green muse entering my green head reflecting on the self-absorption of the brits and how long we waited for them to rage quit hand-splaining sovereignty i saw a young lady who made me lose the run of myself her beauty went through me like a dose and she said mirabile dictu if it's your howl you want and bud you know where to come her eyes are come all ye, her hair waiting down one shoulder, her brow so sweet, so cool, so fair, her skin white as flannel, as salt as a scrub table, her cheeks a handful of roses, lips rosy the same, singing sweeter than the harp of Orpheus, there goes a blooming lass, her words obvious, if it's your hull you want and but, you know where to come. When I heard that douce and dulcet tongue giving out glad lays, I asked her instanter, why didn't you tell me where it is you are from and is you is or is you ain't big JFK's baby, a flash girl, any one of half a dozen, a gallus whore to Captain Townsend, or my own darling daughter. But this was all the answer the pretty maiden made me. If it's your howl you want and but, you know where to come. Then the good gracious woman replied to me blithely, I am in me bollocks, and don't talk to me about captains and cowboys, crap shooters and troopers, jolly young sailors and Willie McBride. Via Albion or Arsenal, I've come from abroad, and it's hard lions for me, seeking the wild world over for a sweet man, only to meet with a chancer. But if it's your hole you're wanting but, you know where to come. By now, I don't mind saying I was fair, salivating. She got up on me like a piece of furniture. I went down on her gaily celebrating the mystery without even Ireland to keep us company. We banged like a drum and played the fife merrily. And if hell is my fate for spending the treasure Christ gave me, shall the pit will be my last home. And if it's my hole, I'm wanting rosebuds, I know where to come. Um, that's a version of a uh, mock Ashling by um, Owen Rua Osuluan. Um, it's kind of the pestilence uh, remix. Um, this next po poem is the title poem of my last collection, Body Servant. Um, it's spoken in the persona of the manservant of Maria Olbenokodola, um, who was an early 
uh, 13th century founder of a dynasty of Gaelic poets. Um, Mariach was a crusader um, and his preferred method of tax evasion was murder with an axe. Um, so on the whole he probably wasn't a very nice man. Um, but he did love his mum, well he loved the Virgin Mary um, and he was very proud of his hair. Um, and the speaker here um, loves him. Um, uh, he, the, the speaker gradually sort of merges um, with the watcher of Giro de Bornel's famous Alba Reis Gloriosus, which is roughly con contemporaneous uh, with um, uh, uh, the, the, the two parts are roughly sort of contemporaneous. Um, which I always think is quite strange, you know, that the troubadours were kicking around at the same time um, as someone like Maria Ognach. Um, so this is Body Servant. I sleep at the foot of the stair, the rough nights of the bed. I know his sleeping breath and it's faint. Perhaps he knows mine. His lungs are congested. He is close to 60 and I am past this year, the middle of life. The fair hair he cut the night before we started for Cairo, a four years pelt that would not shame the Magdalene is gone, as he said, a stringy tonsure. When an attack wakes him, I bring milk and ale. We have both killed men that he might live to this pass. Their grey shades stand between us, so he seems insubstantial. He suffers as tall men do worst with his knees, his back, in the mornings, he is agile like an anvil, as the mounting block he refuses. He and his wife had 11 children, and some of them live far away. He misses her hand beneath his head, he says. To put my hand under his head would be worth the ransom of the son of the king of Cairo, but I've never been lucky. There was a lady the guest of many important men. He visited her when she stayed with them. Then I watched till dawn. I knew her name, but never her face. She was like a gray shape in thought, like a place where a painter meant to fill in one of the three Marys at the tomb, a gray form lying on the body. I know better than my own, its scar furrows turn and turn about. The body to which I attribute every scar on my own, lying on a grey form, until I called out, my fine friend, here comes the dawn, chief glory, glorious lord, here comes the dawn. Um, troubadours um, like Giro um, didn't talk about writing a poem but um, finding one. Um, it's where the name Troubadour comes from of course. Um, so this is a poem that I found in the road. I find I'm on my way to you, tutelar, shabby and locked. If there's single malt in your nostrils you don't need it in your mouth. Last time I got laid, someone else's bacon was frying up the stair. Combined with lube, it smelt like olives steeping in brine. I would say turkey, but others would say grease and be no less wrong. One day this whole mentor slash pupil thing will have to end in the sack or throwing delf, but not yet, my good sweet honey lord, not yet. I want to be your raw boned Hawflin loon so we can be Davy and Alan staging a bit of hurt stroke comfort to cadge a boat. I want to shuck you like an eel, box you like a hare, put you in my mouth like a juice harp. I can turn meat to fruit. Call it a superpower. 
You've been my haze code through most of 20th century, one boat long foot on the floor at all times. But dans le mi-temps du lit, la rivière est profonde. You've managed to rain check joy complete once again forever. I am a narrow eyed freight jumping Appalachian urchin with tattooed knuckles and a knackered paperback of a good man it's hard to find in other stories splayed open on my shoulder, bleeding into my panties as boys have done since before there were panties and I am riding, 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 riding this boxcar away from you, tutelar. Um, this uh, last poem is, a, is an oldie, um, it's from my first um, Shearsman chapbook, Rain Down Can, uh, and it's called Waking. Somewhere on earth, the guest who never leaves means husband. The guest who never leaves a place still has greeting to do. The guest who never leaves an imprint goes off after a bit, somewhere on earth. You who have been to one of the many lands of the dead and danced when one of the many bands of the dead struck up the waltz hesitation, tell me what we owe to those who taste bread off the breasts of the dead, press coin into the many eyes of the dead, or I will think you don't know, or perhaps you don't know. Corporal on furlough, Having none of this crepe, he gobbled deviled eggs, coleslaw, pork pie, jelly, T-bone marrow, guests doing the frug all night to Bayou Rock, monitors and mics wreathed in pink immortelles, then shrieking, self-pity, tumbles without injury, mess to clear in the stalls tomorrow. We passed out. Seven immovable sleepers locked in the function room until shame made the sun rise. You who have been tenant to one of the many lords of the dead and admired when he unlocked one of the many hordes of the dead as if you didn't already know it would hold everything you never had alive your mother's love, education, a gruff son to stay your chides and slaps to pick you up and bear you about once he was tall enough. Or perhaps you didn't know he tackled and took death by surprise, as only the singular can took back death's guest, as mourners waked, death fled. Afterwards, he was inclined to say, you've got to hold fast, as to embrace death, because of all the changes it puts you through. Only once, to my mind, he mentioned gaunt death has no face, as in, no face. Hospitality is very death to women and as hard to keep from as when I, in striking up conversation, we want to put ourselves into our welcomes, not realising that hostess is a hostage, a moor, a death jaw, a hungry hollow doll that will not, once it has received us, ever let us out again. Guests are numerous, a nation complete in themselves, but not everyone, thank fortune, attains the condition of guest, of a childless adult child, gripping something itself received as a gift that no one would dream of buying for herself. Or forecourt carnations. It was a grim party she came back to, her husband's relief sitting like a tinfoil blanket on her shoulders. In time, they found death had not cheated or revenged itself. Death being the opposite of what we are, only did what it could, did only what it could, did what it only could, did what only it could, did what it could only taking one of the many pipe clay simulacra from the fire offering. She stands now 
hesitating in doorways, through windows, low knowing, wicked terror and harried calculation pulled over her face, determined never to go back. Come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes or in our meadows, come not down our lanes. Or in our meadows, come not down our lanes, or in our meadows. Thank you, good night. <laughs> yes, unmute yourselves to clap for that. That was absolutely superb. Um, yeah, we need, we, that's one thing we need to figure out. Uh, Kid, thank you so much for that. That was uh, really, really superb. Um, it was, yeah, God. I It's going to take a while to process that, I think. Um, but that was just absolutely super. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, next up, um, we are going to have Jennifer Matthews reading. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Jennifer, Jennifer has been a part of the, especially the Cork poetry scene, I guess, for a very, very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And anybody who's had anything to do with writing in Cork over the last 10 years will definitely know Jennifer well. Uh, she was also for a long time the editor of uh, the Long Story Short website, which is a really great, still up online and still worth checking out some of the great short stories well long short stories that were uh put up there she's originally from missouri but i think is now a very long-term resident in ireland yeah. her poetry has appeared uh in a huge range of magazines over the years including the stinging fly mislexia banshee uh, and she also had a chapbook published called rootless by smithereens press a couple of years ago which was really fantastic and i'll put a link up to that um to the archive version of that uh, in a little bit. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass you over to Jennifer Matthews. You ready to go there, Jennifer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. Excellent, all right. Um, my goodness, Kate, wow. <laughs> that was just stunning. Um, thanks, uh, David, for arranging this. This is, this is uh, it's fantastic because every one of the readers tonight, I would have made an effort to go see individually. So just to get to hear everybody in one room is is amazing. Um, so thank you. Uh, if you could imagine yourself for the first poem in um, a, a hellish uh, leisure center surrounded by multiple TVs going at once and mirrors all around you. <laughs> that's, that's where we are right now. Um, my first poem is called Workout. TV one, Sierra Leone on lockdown. TV two, a man clutches a woman's ponytail, a horse's rein. I set the elliptical to intervals. Ebola virus could become a bioterrorist threat. She'll eat your heart out like Jeffrey Dahmer. I make a comparative study of other women's arms. 50 Shades of Grey hits the 400 million mark. A woman plays cello in a black lace bra. Over the waistband, my belly sags in awning in a rainstorm. Twitter feud destroyed my life. Yes, I'll be whatever you want me when you're ready. I increase my resistance to eight, start to lose my breath. Uh, the next poem I wrote actually after the, the first um, Sound Eye Festival that I went to after I had my first kid. It was my first outing and it was absolutely amazing. Just like 
being <laughs> somewhere <laughs> just myself and listening to poetry, uh, especially Sound Eye, because amazing. Um, and this came from a conversation that I had with somebody at one of the book tables about, uh, yeah, the, the experience of having a kid. It's called Into the Family Garden. <clears throat> I lost a limb on Independence Day when an aunt embraced me. You don't mind, of course you don't. Gripped my wrist and pulled my arm clean out of its socket. She cradled it, cooed the softness of my skin, and gave it to my cousin where it slipped in his greasy fingers, slicked with corn on the cob butter. He winced and passed it hot potato to our grandmother, who admired my fingers, perfect for the piano. She called to my uncle's grilling outside, lifting my arm to her chest, my fingertips peeking over her shoulder. My lonesome, hand drum, my lonesome hand drummed against a sweating glass of lemonade as muffled cheers washed in. I stiffened and moved to look out the kitchen window into the family garden, and my brother began to laugh. They're playing catch, and I saw the missing piece of me in flight, tossed and tossed again in arcs, and here my queasy pride watching the frantic goodbye, goodbye of what was mine now waving back to me. So I'm moving from Independence Day to uh, May Day of this year. The poem is called May Day 2020 with a line from Auden. My seedlings have gone leggy from all this waiting. For moments of sun chasing, windowsill to windowsill anti-clockwise through this darkening house. My daughter is arranging and rearranging the abandoned Easter decorations on the door to the garden. Shamrock baubles bounce on the stalks of her Alice band, Alice in Nowhere land. She wants to know what day is it? Is it a school day? Is it a holiday? Is it Christmas? Time is broken. I tell her it's another family day. Aren't we lucky? Our tight-lipped poppies nod in the garden, biding their time until their first deep breath Bees wiggle into borage stars propagated from dumb luck, a leftover box of wildflower seeds retrieved from the press to make room for products of panic, bleach, plastic gloves, masks, painkillers, bored of the question, Ava goes back to manic chicks bursting from fractured pastel eggs. I wake the radio for the evening's measurements, frost blights, rates of infection. The news is a shrug. Stop all the clocks. There is still so much more nothing to be done. Uh, so I don't know if, like me, there might be a few insomniacs here. Uh, I had a handy bout of insomnia last night, which prepared me nicely for the reading. Uh, this is an insomnia poem called Prayer. Branches, puzzle cut, the morning light, I step forward inspect a waiting web, then wake. Spider retreats as cones and rods take in the low relief darkness of a borrowed room. And the hiss of heaters shush. I cannot discern if I should rise or fall back within my cloth cocoon. No answer offered by spider or radiator. The question lies on my chest, night feeding. Uh, I have one more, <laughs> one more poem. Uh, this one's called Astray, and I'm going to apologize for my shocking Italian pronunciation. We'll get through it. <laughs> it's called Astray. One. I can't speak the name of the place I'm going to, so I leave written words in the taxi man's large hand. He clutches them, punching letters onto a screen, summoning a map of his ancient city. It whirs in a circle and aligns itself with our headlights. We, both in the taxi and on the screen as a blue bobble, are tied with a wishful string to the idea of where my friends are burrowed in Trastevere. Trastevere. The machine directs him in his language. I palm my phone, saying nothing. 
for my safe passage, there is a coin under my tongue. Two, my body is carried away from Fiumicino along the tentacled roads, the tentacled flow of roads new to me. I gather my mind back from every headline where a woman's body became a landmark. We slow at weeds along a dusky off ramp. I pin a memory of this place to the soft map in my mind, taking note of safety hatches of lift, lit doors and low open windows a voice might reach. I cannot find the driver's eyes in the mirror. There is no music. Somewhere a glass of red is being filled in my name. I'm closer to learning the price of my passage. Three. When I have been ferried over a dark river, we turn down a narrow lane into a stony square where votives flicker on tables. This is my new home. The driver flicks his eyes back for the first time. Echo, here. I thank him for his disinterest, for his unthreatening lift as he removes my baggage from his car. My friends embrace me at their door, buried in honeysuckle. Before we sleep, a feast. Raw ricotta, crust with honey, mortadella. Four, cradling wine glasses, we plot our tomorrow, considering the world in miniature, its maze spread across the table, each of us press our fingerprints to the same road where we last imagined our own deaths. Me too, echo, here, good night. I lay my dress across a chair, unearth my walking shoes enfold my practical fear of men, a passport repeatedly stamped over decades. I stow it inside the cover of my visitor's guide. Thanks. I'm not fast enough to turn off the mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the dog liked it. <laughs> just keep, just keep it hovering. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for that. Um, really, really thanks for great. listening. Really, really great. Um, yeah, and uh, well, hopefully we'll be hearing more uh, in the not too distant from you then uh, if you're getting good news stuff like that out there. Um, so thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm, well, now I'm going to abuse my position as host. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually going to uh, be the person to read next um, and uh, then we'll have Jimmy, Ellen and Dylan so uh, I'll try and keep mine a little bit shorter uh, to give everybody else maybe a little bit more time um, so I'm going to read a couple of new well new yeah new new poems some poems that have been recently published and just I'll, then I'll finish with something from my collection which came out last year um, so this first poem actually I wrote it more than a year ago and I uh, I couldn't remember where I wrote it down and I lost so I lost it and I had to basically reassemble it in my head and I actually think I ended up with a better poem so <laughs> which or well maybe I mean well we'll never know now I guess uh, so this poem is called St. John's Eve uh, better known as Bonna Night to all of you Corkonians uh, that are out there St. John's Eve Gather and collect, press seven wild flowers to my breast to be placed later beneath a pillow for dreaming and revealing. As flames dance and lick and ash, ash rises on a wind carried in a night from Helleviga to Helvic Head. Um, and I guess, well, I guess like everybody, I've been spending an awful lot more time at home these past few months. Um, and so as a result of that, I think I've been thinking more about interiors and writing poems, I guess, about interiors in a way. So this is, this is one of those. This is called Home Library. I had no idea you were pressing plants into the pages of books, leaves and markers, walks by rivers and ditches. I have left my marks too, Flower caking pages where the box tea is, flora and food, recipe as prescription, our medicine written up as gift, bread and roses. Mm. Um, 
And this other little short one. Uh, so I was talking to Jimmy before everybody else kind of came on. And uh, I was actually, I was in Italy just before the the whole thing kind of came on stock. Uh, and uh, I was in Rome, not in the north of Italy. Um, but uh, I wrote this little poem anyway uh, about about that trip. And it's called Roman Holiday. Roman Holiday. At a, at a bench along Via del Portico de Tavio, we sat one Sunday morning eating pastries from the kosher bakery. Full, we stood up, stumbling on cobblestones, awakened from our stupor by the dead. Um, and this is, this is another, well, old but new poem also written about a year ago, uh, but it appeared uh, this summer. Um, Banshee did a summer online lockdown edition, special edition 9.5, and uh, they'd asked me for a poem uh, for it, and I was very glad uh, to be able to give them this poem because it's uh, one I really like, uh, and it's just called July Oslo. It was so hot then, Water was sprinkled on the graves in Rees Schirkegård. We thought about standing under the spray to cool off. Instead, we went to Vigalan's mausoleum. Inside, waiting for our eyes to adjust to the lack of light, bowing beneath his ashes, hearing our breaths echo in this monument to self-regard, the painted bodies of the damned scaled the walls, an idiot eye dropped my keys. The clang rang until the end of time. It's really, really good. Um, and the next, so the next thing I'm going to read uh, is, if July is over and so is St. John's Eve, um, it's maybe a bit more sensible to move on to the current season. Uh, so this is a... Uh, well, it's a, a sequence of kind of short poems, really. It's called Autumn, and it was uh, published in Channel, um, issue two, which is a kind of a new uh, magazine of Irish, I guess, nature writing in its kind of broadest sense. Uh, I was very happy to have this poem published anyway. Uh, and this is called Autumn. So, Autumn. Banjo clang, the strain of song mounting. Bird bashes its beak against the bark. Order the rain first, the idea after. Counting first the days, then the hours. Encountering first the face, then the flowers. The dog lies flat on the decking. Sad reacts only, the death of Marat. Osobuco, sourdough bread, recipe for love. Shucked oysters, Bible tripe, a new leaf, drift water, wash, minus tide, rockaway beach. Autumn shiver, short evening skitter, placed mats. Neat's tongue, shaved membrane, thinly sliced portions. All flowers wilt, all follow with flowers. Crackling, too black for the Holy Ghost. The gap between tail and teller bridged. Birch wood burning, flames firm as ferns. Redoubtable, the reassurance of the horror scope. I dreamt I was a sparrow wrangler. Um, and uh, I'll also read a couple of other short poems uh, that came, if I can find them now. I had it marked earlier and now I've lost it. Fantastic. Let's see. No, I actually have to check the, po the contents page. That's really bad. Uh, let's see. There we go. Cool. Uh, so these are three. Um, these are three shorter, again, three short poems, uh, which appeared in the Stinging Fly winter issue uh, back just before Christmas. And I got to read some of these actually in Ireland back around Christmas time and that was really great fun. I think that was the, the last kind of thing like this I got to do. So it's great to be able to read them again. Uh, so I'll start with this little one. Uh, it's a kind of a nod to the previous poem, Rockaway. Rockaway. 
a stone in my hand like a mouse sliced in half. My calves strain crossing the sand, the ferry as it crosses Puget Sound. Um, and this is even, if you think that's a short poem, this is really short. Oh, uh, yeah. Blinken, you'll really miss this one. This is just a, a poem called Tradition Bearer. No pen but tongue, no page but air, he sung. Mm, that's nice. Uh, and last one from Stinging Fly, this is a little poem called Ghosts. Rain teeming straight as pine needles, the pause between you and your prey. Fool me you foul mire, full mouth. Songs von, swan song, soft song, cross walking, switching code. The letters too make lines, the curve of waves, the cool lines of a forgotten face. A ghost, once a guest, gone now, now gone. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna finish then with this. this so this is this is my book that came out last year. Uh, basically, exactly this time last year, and uh, it's called Northly. It's uh, published by Tourist Press, and uh, I was really glad to get this book out. Um, and it's basically about me living in Norway. Really, um, that's that's basically that's it. I mean, but it's uh, anyway. Uh, this, this this is the title poem. Um, this is. This is Northly, and again, it's kind of a, a sequence of, I don't know, images, maybe? Northly. A hatch handful crossed, a fire built, a burnt cheek. Send for fresh airs to sing. Resolve in new voices what time dissolved. Home burnt, home brewed, holy heaven-bent song. Sound met light, one the other crossed. A rope ream. Three knots, a knotted chord of music, a song, song, mean sister song, de the hested, a dream of latitudes. First, a gentle breeze, looses stiff winds, then such raging gales that the banshee sings, their eye for the rocks removed, their bodies splayed across the sound. Give me a length of rope, three knots long, three rivers, ships, or sails, and I will tie them to the tide. Redraw the red raw traces of a hand that laps at the water, the waves ushering in a new tide, signature of a new time being traced in the head sands. The sea soon knows seaman from showman, charlatan from captain. Sunstone turned to the sky as the summer comes in with its cuckoo cry, the cadence driving over the whaleway. When the turf tower and the pit become your bed, your touch and voice only worms will ken. What help then the world? You will, I hope, excuse the poverty of the feast. Winter we spent breaking through the shingle roof of the salmon's hall. We could gaze through the glazed dome easily. We could dream of the feast. The cold truth of such desire eats you alive. These blue fields, the cod's domain, it's heather we dry on deck and drink good health. To our ocean harvest we dream of the fat, snowy flesh of fish. Wish to suck from our thumb, but knowledge is knowing the sea heather is all that stands between us and our starvation. With all afflictions, do not give up your ghosts so lightly. Keep them to your breast. Let them dance and sing, feed them, make them strong. That seems rather ambitious. The bird road buzzes with the traffic of rain barrels. The destroyer of trees, sail harmer, sends our water horse this way and that. We dream of the malt waves, but only the brine cracks our lips. On the boat breakers, standing, drafting a dream of dinner, a line from me to the water. Out of the boiling ocean we came to plunder. The meats of the sea sustain our salty mission. That's it for me. Thanks. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, <laughs>
Let me see. I've misplaced my notes. Just one second. Aha. Super. So uh, after that, I'm very, very glad to be introducing uh, Jimmy Cummins. Um, Jimmy, I have known too long, maybe, uh, at this stage. It's, uh, God, it must be 13 years, maybe? Something like that. Um, anyway, Jimmy... Uh, has been many things. Uh, he is currently a teacher in East London, uh, so says his bio, and he uh, has in the past published books including Origins of Process by the Wild Honey from Wild Honey Press, uh, as well as Flash Bang from Veer Books. Jimmy has also run in his own time a Default Poetry Magazine and Publishing, uh, two very influential presses for me, as well as his Foam and Fontanelles and a variety of other things which he did in collaboration with other people. Uh, he's also one of the people who was for a long time responsible for the co-organizing of the Sound Eye Poetry Festival, which ran for many years. Um, so it's a great privilege always to introduce uh, Jimmy to read. Uh, so I'll hand it over to him. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, just thanks for David for organizing all of this and to, to be reading alongside so many uh, sort of wonderful people, um, not just poets, but just wonderful people in general. Um, it's also, though, breaking my heart just seeing the mm. faces of various people from parts of my life that I have not seen in so long. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's yeah. Um, I'm going to start by just reading a poem by Gemma Jackson um, from her uh, a small book, uh, A Prior, which I think is Italian, but I don't know. A note a day in memory of that grey strand you tried to find because it was always literal in lines as definition yanked tight millimeters in wrapped pans repeating won't be forgotten punctuation and open o's there is so much that i understand about yellow split innocuous behind my eyelids still blinking uh, and that that was published from uh, Broken Sleep Books, um, and it's just something I've really enjoyed over the last uh, couple of months. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read, um, and apologies about my voice, I've had a cold, and obviously being a teacher, I'm shouting a lot. Um, so if, if oh, it nice. starts to break, <laughs> yeah, if it starts to break, just forgive me, it's, uh, I, I, I'm not crying, or I, I'm, you know, just, I might be losing my will to live. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, here are some new poems. Um, God is change. We follow the path into the forest. The branches spread and weave like a government slogan. We fought the mark and bought the bile while, wind while wildflowers grew and swept away. By the way, along the wayside and fell. We all fall. It is the fixed point in history. God is change. A great beauty in all that. At the end of the day, in line with the face of life, from a table or the table in the middle of 18 grey houses, we rose in accordance, developing before becoming laws of the state. Heads to hold. I found you sleeping and struggled to carry you. I find you and I find my brother along the dead run road. I find the air is verbal. Where we gather now is fraught with cryptic messages. I desire to unfurl the gut feels that language lost, failing to call into being, stifled. Those wee explosions leave me bait and fightless. Sin is the lived experience, turned to bone or bony tissue, sup from the verb, the question not intended, tossed on the fire heap, flaming logs of oak and ash, the kingmaker, a rudimentary text where I spoke in the present tense. This next poem is called, I might just leave poetry to those who give a fuck. Even the air can't breathe, stuck skin and sweat to the sheets every day I hope to write. In the absence of life, I find the city sounds comforting, revving the final chat. The first rests, the second is oil slick, the third and final act is tragic. Is every poem a carcass being dragged around and made to dance? We can dress up the dead, but they are still dead. Sometimes the motion is caught midstream, a singular vessel remade in different gear. From soil or story or thread, we risk nothing but find an empty glass. The late distill, somewhere I lost my treacle blood. In fairness, we gutter in the eve, silent flaying. Press send and repeat, look busy and repeat, repent and repeat. 
We flock and the dead horse open its mouth and look in, hoping to find gifts. Glassy worked and workshop to shit, caught the line, hoped it was a fish. Kick back, back slap, slap stick, stick man, manhole, hole punch, punch bag as the line swells and sail, the city rises. I can't finish a poem for the left or lose in middle C. Run through the history with sorrow, one time more, three times four. Flip the gravel cade, into touch a word to break a play. There is excitement on the street, verbal in infinite jest denying abstraction. Splice the leaf, split the seam, surrender the fall, where the line splinters, jockeying for slaps, the night rolls in. This doesn't have a title. In the unfinished cursing out of the poetic line, I stand adrift, as you do. I speak to myself faintly. This is built to last or be bested between me, a human, and another, there is a litany of failures. Picking up the language of one upmanship, the fallen symbols of my origin, the gesture are true and plumb. Nylon threads woven through each utterance, longing patterns and responses, where we left off, I think, where the brick fell, spectral vectors, the calling of names is called aberration. Crisp. Fashions for forgetting. Lonely is not a state of being, but being without, planted among the crises, which continuously bloom, born out of winter. The crawling wind takes love, turns on a twopence, and hey, he said, walking swiftly along the equilibrium. Sequin, Belisandrian, we call our mothers mother and trail lights, red and blue and a sudden drop, and green and blue and red wither to step out amongst the asphalt and afternoon drinkies, seized by the longing for guilt and other histories, the stinging sweetness cast into the ebb. This is called Eleven. I would mimic my obsession with yellow. You gestured Spanish rose, memory and time rose and roared out of step full body voices, trapped as a descriptor. In magnetic tape too hot to sleep, reinstate the shades I would like to pull from the ceiling along the way. Living on a hill, avoiding the trials. Nothing is a surprise, so I sit quietly. The future rolls in, watching burnt things burn. <clears throat> and this one's called My Brother. <clears throat> and I am, I'm losing my voice as I go. Sleep, silent and stir. The air tense as we face reflected conversation. My brother on a hilltop, interlocking fingers, clammy skin pressed in comfort. My brother set sail, waving from the gangway. No band, flowers neatly stretched, pages not supporting towers, administered, unlikely admission. God fearing relics, my brother prepare for the influx, staggering the weight of friendship, unlocking a tiny hand, gripping, imagining possibility, a sure shot, my brother, singular, hardly, rebuild, remake, re, re, reshoot again, my brother, extend the chance, patterns of sleep, the ability to write belongs as it does, rose, raised, as it does, the linear effect on the page, and, and the natural light, tired eyes, crisp, a city in reverse, images of twine, twin knots, my brother, whole gesture spoken, found the afterword, I startled a fox, docked cynical, our own evidence of harm. Uh, again, more untitled. Feign the laugh to live in this hellmouth. Cosmic, comical, blistering progress, where the inevitable death rains down, the stance is a waste without the characters next to you, locked in the descending stairwell. Poems are brittle, any stress my body breaks along the eggshells, again we are here, the speculative night, trap, longing to live and sleep, torn in bile, flagging dust particles in space, planetary alignment, the lone speck in time, the here trap, where we fall, the mustard trap, yellow frame, work beyond the binding. We call our lives journeys, but I want to stay still and live and rest and live and talk into the conversational abyss, 
over and over in breaking sweat the world turns pinwheel freak unmask the brazen lies behind lies beyond the hemisphere streak vapor another night in descriptors cloaked along the silent sky straight to failure new guy meet and greet from behind yellow tape systems of control laughter break turn call a spade a dying world another page it's 1985 your response is predictable what rhymes with take a break half full past the cotton dreams fitful laugh a pleasant footfall bits of lines and fruit the arrival of deliveries marking out the books i have not yet read each one not secure red dots flame lights and flickering vexations across days pages reeling um i'm going to read a couple now i think i skipped a few along the way somewhere i don't know i printed double sided and i got confused um these are from a, a series called cities uh, which I started writing in 2011 um, and wrote loads more, but then lost loads because of some um, problems with computers. Uh, but hopefully uh, these will be coming out relatively soon in the next few months or six months or so. Uh, but there'll be more of that uh, when, I, when I know more details specifically. So I'll just um, pick a few. There is hair everywhere. One dog wakes while the other sleeps and the bees are having a wonderful time. I tried to find my way out of this poem, so dig a hole and search for water but fail and let the weather take over. I will miss the rain and wind and shouting over them so you can hear. I will miss the road and the apple trees and the silence and the clear night sky raining light. I will miss the footfalls, the sound of cattle sleeping and the conversations lost in the dark. I will miss missing you and waiting for you to return, but I too am still there, no matter how far I walk the circumference of the earth. A hundred billion plus voices, all ringing home. We flaunt the existence of linear time and buckle down among yellow gorse. Heather angels shipwrecked along the boggy marsh. There is nothing but the thread from you to them to the crystal gray rod of profit. I want to wait to respond, but the dead stay dead and the living fluctuate. The exact frequency remains unknown. We become solid and static while looking back. The valley behind us as clear as day. The simile redundant in this climb. The holy mother of fucking Christ called and asked if you could come out to play. His exact words were, row on my man, row on. And I took leave of myself and slowed the orbit of the world. I find the moments before thunder to be exacting and wish po poems flew fast in the face of all that is holy and right. We take the sun road north and follow the path of through the entrails of our community. All animals are not created equal. Some are moody and steal away in the night. When I say I followed, what I mean is that I heard you cry and deleted the poem as an act of liberation. We praise our inaction and justify the mountains we build on top of scrap heaps and scrag top tailed. The language we use is so full of waste and misdirected bards. It is no wonder we are nomads and slink off into the night. Once I found a little patch of light upon the apex. I stopped and sent back word that the sun followed me and that I was sorry I left nothing but darkness. But the world turns as we cut and fill our lot and lay to waste whole regions of deposits still reeling and speaking. The tiny petals crease the teardrop and I break into a list of verbs. My action is absol absolute and caught in the fix. Where there is water, there is a chance to change the molecular structure of poetry and expelled air. We all dance the single swing and turn regret into mulch. Bitter seeds grow in bitter ground and I fail to call forth the voyages of Brendan the Navigator or that Greek fella who just wanted to go home. We all have a story. Mine is not worth listening to and that is okay. It has been heard before. I cast nets and sails and thousands of tiny pieces of colorful paper before consulting my maps and the tears of the prophets. I cry too 
and find the simple interaction with mathematics and celestial beings impossible. There is a wolf at the door. There are voices on the line. There is one more song before returning home. Daylighting our lived arteries, which run with the bulls and lunar time. I place our lost contact on hold and pray the only way I know how. Eyes roll deep within my head. Where do we start in the runes that so many call jewels? Where do we go and how do we teach trapped within the chambers of history? There are lines intersecting and then there are breezes which seem to ghost us, leaving us to doubt our very existence. The phone rings. There is always phones ringing. The production of wings is now unethical and only the worthy whose lives are scaled back and sanded will rise to the top. I log on and register my disapproval, become ephemeral. My bones turn to water and falls from the sky in heavy bursts of contrition. And one more. Flowers are nice. The desire wound right around the starting line where the wind picks up. The hard outer shell, sharp to a point, opens out into pale blue blooms. The sky welcomes the shift and crumbled sheets where a tiny head and tiny hands lay sleeping. I pivot where the meaning starts to fray while remembering the kaleidoscope of orange and black land and flutter and land again. Resigning myself to the fact that I will not transform came easy. One look in the mirror and the wound reopened in the present tense. Breathing does not come easy. Every movement is forced and considered, but somehow I play my part in receding the wildflowers and weeds. I am worth my weight in fruit, or at least I take that to be my truth. Thank you. Fantastic, Jimmy. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, that was great. And uh, I think yeah. I, I saw Cal Doyle uh, commenting. And I think a, a lot of us, any of us who've been following your updates of the Cities series, have been looking forward to hearing them being read. Uh, so it's really great to actually hear them as well. Uh, and some really memorable lines in there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, fantastic. Um, so just, I, I asked some people and some people have responded, but not everybody has, but so we've people from as far away as Canada and Cavan. Uh, I'm here in Oslo, uh, we have people in Scotland, uh, the UK, Norwich. Uh, I presume there's some Corkonians. We've West Limerick being represented um, as well. So it's, uh, it's great that, uh, there's people from so many places uh, tuning in and it's one of the cool things about this, although it sucks that we can't be in the same. Hi Walt! Even though we can't be in the same place, it's still nice that for those of us who wouldn't normally get to be together, we can be. Um, so that's really fun. Uh, yeah, next up is, um, I believe it's Ellen's turn now. So uh, just to give you a, a potted biography, uh, Ellen Dillon is also a teacher. I, I, I feel like I'm only the only person in the room who isn't one. Um, so Ellen Dillon is a teacher. She's based in West Limerick. Um, and she has so many chapbooks, it puts me to shame. Uh, there is, recently there is Excavate, which is poems after Pasolini from Oyster Catcher. There has been Sonnets to Malkmus, from Sad Press. Uh, Morsel May Sleep is forthcoming from Sublunary Editions. Achatina Achatina is forthcoming from Soundai. And she also, like Jennifer, had a chapbook published by Smithereens called Heave. Uh, so there's no shortage of places to find Ellen's work. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this because uh, I've been reading lots and lots of her stuff, including uh, some so yes, Kate is just commenting about butter. I think we're all very excited for some butter-based poems here. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, I will uh, pass over to Ellen and let her take us through the second half of the evening. Okay, thank you very much, um, David. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, and uh, thank you for organising this. It's just so wonderful to see everybody. Um, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna give the people what they want and start with butter. You'd be sorry. <laughs> um, so the first piece I'm going to read is from um, 
the more madcap project that kept me going on the second half of lockdown. It's uh, a series of documentary poems um, that use a variety of sources to look at a thousand years of Irish history through the lens of butter. So it's a mixture of poetry and prose and the prose is from the point of view of butter. I'm sure why wouldn't it be? So this piece is called In Taste Resembling Spermaceti. Butter made rancid by keeping in bogs. Why or wherefore the people put their butter in bogs, I cannot tell. Converted into a hard yellowish white substance like old Stilton cheese and in taste resembling spermaceti changed into the animal substance denominated adiposere. In 1817, a mass of this bog butter or tallow, weighing about 23 pounds, was discovered in a bog on the Galti Mountains. Bog butter is always found at a great depth in old solid bogs. Whether the vessels were originally buried at that depth, whether they were placed near the surface and in lapse of years sunk, or whether the bogs have grown over them, are questions I cannot determine. How many years it would take to produce the remarkable change exhibited by all the specimens which have been discovered is a question of much interest. Two circumstances may have influenced those who buried this butter. It was done either for the purpose of security or in order to produce that very change in it, which Petty calls rancid. I hear whale song in my submerged firkin. Maybe I was scuttled under dark water to achieve the taste and texture of a whale wax. I wasn't meant to lie here for a thousand years, just long enough to harden into tallow, to light long winter nights. I would have been hauled up, compact, friable, good for burning, but for my marker lost to bog burst. My favourite story from the enduring mystery of bog butter is from a paper once given by Oscar Wilde's father on Irish food before the potato. In passing, he mentions that the taste of bog butter is similar to that of spermaceti, a hard, white, waxy substance found in the skull cavities of sperm whales. It tickles me beyond measure, imagining Sir William sampling a sliver of thousand-year-old butter dredged up from the Galti mountain bogs and then trying other waxy things to find the closest match in taste and texture. How many fats did he chomp through, I wonder, before settling on this particular cetacean residue? His digression on bog butter emphasises how little is definitively known about its origins and purpose. But where other scholars meander into speculation about a possible role in rituals or votive offerings, Wilde sticks closely to what he can establish using his own senses. This leads him to note the similarity to tallow and other animal waxes, and to suggest that one purpose of leaving large deposits of butter in the bog might have been to deliberately produce this very transformation, producing wax for lamps and candles. Now, this is not the only reason butter has been found in bogs. I'm trying to avoid the trap of spinning a single theory that I can stretch to fit the evidence. It is very likely that bogs were used to keep butter cool in summer. It is possible that wrapping butter in wild garlic and immersing it in bog water was a way of flavouring the butter. If I don't find the thought appealing, it's not really worse than the buckets of chewy sour milk that were considered a summer delicacy. There may have been a votive aspect to some deposits, but if so, it seems peculiar that so few references to this practice have been recorded. It is undeniable that whatever the motive for putting butter in the bog initially, many deposits have been found as the social upheaval and displacement that reached a crescendo in the 17th century led to the abandonment of settlements in haste. The bodies of Old Crohan Man and Cashel Man found in the Bog of Allen show signs of torture and death ritual compatible with human sacrifice. The same bog has yielded a steady trickle of treasures down through the years it's been mined for peat and turf. It's probably natural to want to link the firkins of butter with these stories. To me, and I know I'm in danger of a metaphorical turn of my own here, transforming butter into light is a richer and more compelling alchemy. In the darkest of times, as my continued thriving would come to be catalyst and marker of the collapse of the culture around me, 
I take solace in the patient science of those who learn to turn me into candle wax. Okay, that's the bit of butter. Um, right, the next things that I am going to read are all from um, my new book, which I'm so excited about, which is going to be out in spring next year with sublunary editions. It's called Marcel May Sleep, and it's got poems in English and French, all of which take as their starting point um, samples from a textbook that Malarmé wrote to teach um, English uh, grammar to French students um, using proverbs, as you do. Um, so I'm only going to read from the English side of the book this evening. And um, I see that um, Kai Draper is here. Hi, Kai. Um, Kai and Mira Matar and I um, started doing a, a poem a day thing um, during April and sending each other poems to keep ourselves going over lockdown. And if it wasn't for Kai and Mira, these poems would never have been finished. They would just have been in, in another pile. They would never have been finished. They would never have been sent out. They would never have been a book. So thank you so much to the two of you. Um, right, so the first one is called Nouns. Woman conceal. Several very common words keep their Saxon plural. Woman conceal all. Children stand quiet. Plow before the oxen. Fear death as children, piper a penny, agree like brethren, and the goose to fire, and the goose make the market. So many geese, and why so singular to illustrate a Saxon plural? And not all brothers are even brethren, agreeable or otherwise. Some foul-tempered foul, foul -tempered fowl are hissing and spitting. There will be much more of that as time indoors goes on. A plough for a plough and a team of oxen would see us right right now. Tilling and growing would be something doing for and with children against death. No standing or quiet, but little fear either and no concealing. Some agreeing and more growing. Um, these next two prose poems um, don't have names. Impossible for any one of us to live on a grope for a year. I mean, really. And yet here we all are, beating ourselves up alone for failing to break even in this system built to break us. As even pain is not without, without a witness, we essay ours for silent sharing. What you haven't in your hand, you can't hold, and bearing is tiring. Trying out those words again, four of them are rotten, and it's spreading to the other ones. If the devil is a vicar, he'll wed us to what doesn't die, quoth the fly upon the coach to the ladybird inside. When we have nothing left to give, a Roland style peripatetic headless soldier of fortune will track us to this hiding spot to off us where we sit in thought. Hold whatever words are left, dear as two eggs, scooped intact from a fallen nest. I can't say what wolves have or don't have, since I don't know what they are. Maybe they have thorns, or perhaps a reticulated surface, comforting to slide the fingers over. When the evening cries wine, or more often beer, sloshes in to fill a space whose dimensions wax and wane. When mad words overflow us, only time and pacing stem the ranting. In a fairy story, a self-aware princess might eat peas stashed under her mattress or share her hall of cherries with the beggar before moving on, making and stretching out space between herself and the closing in walls of her kingdom. In return for her slight gift, small thanks and words of well-wishing buoy her up and keep her going. She finds in time the words are leaves dappling her way and lending a film of zesty green to shield her from the blue. She palms them over in return for meat, drink and cloth, saving the best and most considered ones to savour over the bread of a day, sometimes broken with a companion 
but more often alone. In either case, she doesn't miss wine or the priest. Okay, and um, the last one I'm going to read is the long, sorry, the long um, final poem from the book, well, the, the final English poem. Um, it's called Melt Song. Sorry, I forgot to breathe. And put water up my nose. Okay, this is Melt Song. Words and no deeds never can fill a sack. Only slump glumly alongside an empty one, waiting to be picked up and brandished or bundled. We live on the far side of where the animals are now. So sometimes we must play the fox vex boatmen with their sacks of grain and poultry, trick gingerbread men, set all at sixes and sevens amongst the doomsday chickens. We've been taught to count our worth in baked goods and dairy. Five loaves a penny tells us it's a buyer's market, set to make fat wolves of the prowling boyos. Owl thinks her young too good for the mess of hormone and ritual clogging the air in the rooms where we go for schooling to learn our place and how to move in it. She still thinks they will learn wisdom by the follies of others, fly without falling or failing. But if woman conceal all, or conspire to hide the tangling links or chains of stops and starts that string together in learning any single thing, children stand quiet, still, and quite, quite vacant. Dead lice dropped out of their feathered heads feathered heads once and were just left unremarked and uneaten. If she is right that the devil is in dice, the sin is in the rolling. Every deed seeds five other chains of movement, one of stasis. Each word chosen leaves others adrift to clog the air with their six-legged corpses. Idle people take this so much to heart it stops them in their tracks. Words just know who is afraid to use them. So the ones who think silk makes the difference between fitting in and falling out will find it is not, in the end, the feeling, but the movement and the reaching that shakes them out of silence, sends them stumbling and shivering to the world's end and beyond. Swarms of paper wasps haunt these roiling plains. Copper-coloured live ones come in pudding time to feed on molten sugar and sting us into singing. Thank you very much. It's uh, just amazing, Ellen. Um, and I think that probably means that sublunary editions are going to get an awful lot of pre-orders. Uh, it's, uh, yeah really really incredible um and so we come to our final reader of the evening um and i am really 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 delighted uh, i have to also say thank you to dylan for his patience um, it's never easy being the last person up on a, on a when you're doing a reading like this um so thanks to dylan for that and i'm delighted that he's here and i'm also delighted anyway because he's here and that he's in ireland in one way because we weren't sure if dylan was going to be uh, able to do it because uh, he might have been in Mexico City at a time that would have meant he was watching to make sure kids weren't smoking and drinking and not doing their homework. Um, <laughs> so Dylan Brennan, uh, what most recently uh, he won the Ireland Chair of Poetry Bursary Award in 2019. Uh, his debut collection was Blood Oranges. Um, which was published in 2014 uh, and it's a really fantastic collection and it's uh, one of my favourite poetry books of the last decade and I really think if if anybody can find a copy they should make sure to get it. Uh, he's also recently been a, a co-editor of a, an academic collection uh, of essays on the Mexican writer Juan Rolfo uh, and a million other things, collaborations and everything that Dylan has done. His work has appeared in Winter Papers and a variety of fantastic places over the years. And uh, it's a real, I'm really excited to hear what Dylan has to offer for us this evening. Uh, so I will uh, let Dylan uh, see us out for the evening. So thank you very much, Dylan. 
Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, not sure how to follow all those, these other brilliant writers, uh, but uh, I'm delighted to be here, especially because when I did I think my first real reading down in Cork, uh, when Blood Oranges came out, David read with me as well as Roisin Kelly. That was fantastic, fantastic event. Anyway, thanks for having me and thanks uh, everyone uh, for being here and sticking around. Um, going to read mo all new poems, uh, mostly short, and I suppose um, during a pandemic, uh, I, like a lot of people, have been drawn to kind of poems about the natural world. Um, anyway, I'll just begin. This is called After an Ultrasound. I find myself down the back field surveying the flora at my toes. Beige and purple clover blossoms and violet heel-alls or woundwort among the green asterisks of dandelion and near the white flecks of yarrow there's a fragile trefoil I identify later a reverse image search on my phone and more familiar yellows of buttercups and daisy hearts and knocking gently against my shins the almost stooping black heads of the ribwort plantain a wildflower once used to bring back the dead and I cannot believe as children we just called it all grass. The next two poems are about um, taking bits of Ireland back to Mexico, um, literally and otherwise, and probably illegally from uh, places like Malin Head and Ireland's Eye off the coast of Dublin. This one's called Bog Cotton. Only hours before the spotting began, we took a walk in the sun and bluster along the northernmost part of the peninsula, the northernmost part of my country, our island country, and saw the only clouds in that hot day were the ankle high tufts that marked out for us like a warning, the softest turf, common cotton sedge or bog cotton. I picked some and so disrupted, destroyed, an emophilous potential on that windiest hillbrow. Days later now on the other side of the Atlantic in our tiny apartment on what were once the shores of an island in a lake. The dried flowers spill out from my wallet as I look for a phone number. I hold the perianth up to the morning light and drink hot coffee while you sleep. I place the fragile whiteness on a windowsill saucer by the succulents to be blown out, carried when the rains come. The next one's called Ireland's Eye, which is a little um, island off the coast of Dublin. Uh, this poem was uh, shortlisted uh, for the Anthony Cronin Poetry Award just a while back, and it's going to be published in Crano, so thanks to the editors there. Ireland's Eye. The northern gannets, black and white razor bills, damp ferns, creamy speckle of cow parsnip that unexpected carpet of large daisies that led us to the summit with our sandwiches. Lily, my brothers, a friend who'd lost his mother. Where we ate and passed my hip flask around, single malt whiskey and the sun-dried tomatoes salted on our tongues by the easterly sea spray. I take down from my kitchen shelf a jar that used to contain mustard and pour onto the table what I took from that island what Simon scooped up into an old crisp packet, microscopic fan shell upon sand and pebbles and what I think is the vertebra of a fish taken cold from the Irish sea and dashed on rocks, a matte organic little puck that sits on top. Every time I do this, every time I brush it all back into the jar, I leave in the flexion creases of my palm, some traces behind some crushed saltiness of motherland. I'm going to read a few poems now from a, a sequence called Battalion that is, uh, it's been inspired by the story of the St. Patrick's Battalion. So as Dave mentioned, I live in uh, Mexico most of the time. And I was reading the history of these Irish soldiers that during the Mexican War or the US invasion, which is a more accurate description of it, uh, some Irish soldiers who were fighting for um, the U.S. switched sides up at the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo and found themselves fighting for Mexico in a far-off country. Um, and sort of preparing these poems, I took a lot from anonymous old Irish poetry, uh, 
Dubliners, James Joyce, Aztec poems, um, and various other sources. So I'm going to read a bit of a sequence. It feels it apt feels today because today is Mexican Independence Day. Battalion. The river before war. Boys and men from both sides would bathe in the river before war, stepping on the same sediment so close they could touch, bobbing and rising lightly in the swell and pull of the enemy's ripples, sleeping in their camps with the river inside them, in their hair and under fingernails. Why I cross the river. The soft edges of Ireland, a waterlogged country, begin to fade from memory. An ink of feathers across the surface, the blackbirds disguised as bathing women. A hedge before me, I long for an island, a land full of stars, I'm as ruthless as I'm poor. At least there'll be music down there in a softer bed. I'm fragile, damp and in pain. The sweetest thing I imagine, the defeated face of an enemy in an open desert country, the mesquite torn like a grief lodged under the skin, the limitation of horizon. I stir vinegar into my coffee as an antidote to stupor. I travel to my death in silence. Desertion. Edge of life, the sturdy corn is green. There is no green darker than a cornfield in the rain. Every dream I have is of a woman where I crouch down her body sunk in clay. I'm in want of an amulet against loneliness. I pray and the body decays. These mountains tell the distance through mist and foam to desire. Beyond the muscles of the river is a widespread country. I see my mother as a buzzard and toward this land in bewilderment. Outside Monterey, Samuel French crouched to gop at two horses still eating sooty grasses as their entrails slumped out into morning. Alone and speechless, he inhaled the foam of their still livingness. The soil is black as the putrid mush of the blighted spuds that drove so many westwards, and as black as the coffee outside Monte Morelos as cold as the endemic species of Nuevo Leon that exist out there in the darkness. Rare variations of golden rods and Gordon's bladder pods, sparks of yellow desert flats, gypsum soils, and the needles of the cacti I can see because I know they're out there pricking at the languid vapors. Black as the moonless gloom of the Battle of Monterey, the soot on lungs and faces behind cannons at the citadel, Unbreathable clouds from the 12 pound howitzers, grape shots, sandbags, cobblestones, pickaxes, and the coagulated blood coughs of the boys with yellow fever, of the chlorophyll voids of gaping mouths of an entire island abandoned by their gods to ingest infected pulp, the boils of their sadness dripping back to the soil, cursing the diseased earth, one melancholy for another. Black as hunger and the beating of a man till he stops. So I'm going to read one that's a bit more uplifting. So I'm just going to have two poems out. Uh, I say it's uplifting, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's set in a graveyard. You know? um, Glen Cree is a place in Wicklow, not too far from South Dublin. And um, there's a little grotto there. There's a lovely river. But there's also a cemetery, um, the German cemetery for mostly anonymous uh, German citizens and a few German soldiers. Um, it's kind of a hidden gem in the Wicklow Mountains. So this is, um, this is called A Prayer at Glen Cree. The ferns around the rims of the fan-shaped cemetery, photos of the sick dead or grateful that grow mouldy in the grotto, the mercury-coloured ripples of the twin tarns above, glacial descendants nestled in moraine, the bagabone ghosts of St. Kevin's Reformatory, still porous by the brick facade, their blue knuckles shoving snow before breakfast, escaping to Dublin or exposure on the feather beds. Those Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe who fell anonymous to this island are washed up purple on the beaches. And off the coast of Tory, civilians torpedoed by their own countrymen denied a life post Canadian internment. Probably the last river I stood in, 
healing waters, the brief miracle of a mountain stream and a ruptured tendon, and the smooth massage of the larger pebbles on the tired arch of the naked foot. Were I a believer, I would compose a new prayer for the Virgin of the Valley, Our Lady of Glencree, for there is so much here on this neutral green earth, so many to be watched over. So I'll finish, uh, I'll finish with this one. It's called, And What Is My Heart? And a woman said, my breasts are milkless, my eyes are damp, my skeleton is frail, it rattles. And what I want is this. I want you to kill me, to kill me now instead. And another woman said, what am I without my child? And what is my heart from this day until the last? A cold clot of blood. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Wow. Yeah. That's unreal. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Dylan, thank you for that uh, <laughs> incredible uh, finish. That's just... Uh, Thanks for having I, I think I need to lie down after that. I know. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, they were just absolutely fabulous. Um, and I had no idea about that in uh, Glen Cree. That was, that's uh, really, really interesting. Um, and the work and, mm. and hopefully we'll see, um, hopefully we'll see the Brigade poems out because they, they're really fantastic as well. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it, everyone. Um, I guess it just falls to me again to say thank you to Kit, to Ellen, to Jennifer, to Jimmy, uh, to Dylan. That was just absolutely fantastic, all of you. Um, and it's great to see that the lockdown hasn't really stopped us mm. from creating new work. Uh, so we've lots to look forward to when things change. I don't know if we can say they'll go back to normal anymore, but they'll mm. change and hopefully change for the better. Uh, so just thanks a million for everybody who's tuned in. Uh, wherever you've been in the world uh, for however long you've tuned in for it's been great to have you um, and uh, yeah I just want to say thanks a million so just one more round of applause thanks David <laughs> thank you David thank you thanks very much guys okay